Super Readers. Oh, they are about the persistence of the seed in human living and in human knowing. It's very clear there that Satie himself had found that there's a calming uh, aspect of the sea, a healing aspect of the sea. Matthew Arnold, the great uh, poet of uh, Dover Beach, Sister Andre, and uh, I share a great love for him, begins a love poem, The Sea is Calm Tonight, and, uh, and talks about something that Sophocles, one of the great Greek tragedian, tragedians heard on the sea that maybe he was able to put into words and maybe not. But the sea, Melville makes the sea the scene in which Moby Dick takes place. Moby Dick is the great American novel. And Melville says in the opening pages of that novel, there is something about human beings that if you put them within several miles of the sea, they will gravitate towards it. We know that baptism is a common element in a number of different religions. And the sense of it is that it washes us in the same way that the sea does. And there is some sense in human beings that we somehow have to be washed. There's a sense in us that uh, for us to recognize ourselves and to come to a clear understanding of things, refreshment is necessary. And that comes from the sea, and I want to turn now, we're at the end of 90 seconds, to the sea in the Iliad. <laughs> because the sea is Achilles' mother. It's done in terms of a goddess in the Iliad, because the Iliad is a mythical creature, but all of us are children of the sea, and Achilles' mother is named Thetis. And we're going to open our Iliads because I'm going to force myself to get into this text no matter what. You won't believe how many ideas are running through my head that I'm deliberately saying, no, you will not talk about those are. <laughs> so we'll go to page 11 in the Iliad. Here's the story of the Iliad as it opens. Now the Greeks are outside of the city of Troy and a plague hits the Greek troops. Well, they've been there for a number of years, and any medical authority could tell you to get a large number of people together on a confined space for a number of years, you're going to get some kind of cholera or other epidemic, and a plague hits the Greeks. <coughs> and they start dropping. But instead of calling in a doctor to diagnose the situation, which is what we would do, they call in a religious figure, a soothsayer. And they say, this plague must have a supernatural origin. It's the story of Job in the Old Testament when Job gets beaten around somebody and says, God's after you for some reason. And they call in the soothsayer and says, yeah, there is a reason. It says, Agamemnon took as a trophy the daughter of a priest of Apollo. The priest of Apollo came back and said, please give me back my daughter, she's <coughs> sacred. And the government says, go to hell. <laughs> and the soothsayer says, that's not nice. <laughs> and Agamemnon says, well, okay, if I'm going to give her back, I'm going to take somebody else's girl. And the girl he takes is Achilles' girl, and that's it. Achilles goes ballistic. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like a... George Bush saying to John McCain, I'm going to take part of Arizona. <laughs> and that's exactly the situation. Agamemnon is the leader. Achilles is the dramatic person that everybody loves. Nobody cares too much for the leader. But the leader knows the guy to go after is the really popular one. So you're going to take my girl away because of something I did to the order of the sacred. I'm going to take away somebody that it's really going to hurt to have this girl. And when he takes away Achilles' girl by sea, it's and Achilles, as we'll see in a moment, it goes ballistic and we have a great argument out of which emerges the whole tragedy of the fall of Troy. And Homer's interest is only in the fact that anger causes the death of cities. Anger causes the destruction of families. Anger causes the cessation of friendship. Homer was used in the elementary schools of ancient Greece. The 
message that he gives in the Iliad is be very, very careful of your anger. Here's a whole book that's written about nothing else but anger. And the psychology of anger there is an extraordinary psychology. First of all, Achilles uses every word in his vocabulary to demean Agamemnon, and Agamemnon demeans him back. You've all been in that kind of a fight. We've, I've been in that kind of a fight. Maybe you haven't. Ah, <laughs> uh, your mother wears combat boots. <laughs> you think I'm bad. Take a look in the mirror at yourself, you moron. <laughs> This goes on, and Agamemnon finally wins. He gets Achilles' girl. And then Achilles goes to the sea. In the same way that you or I would, nature heals. But Homer means to say something more than that. He's like this, the going in the sea, going to the sea, is something like going and talking to God. Now, the Greeks did not have the sense that uh, when you go and talk to God, God's going to say to you, okay, forgive him. Greeks didn't have that sense. <laughs> the gods got on your side and said, yeah, you've had a pretty rough time, but I'll lop them a couple for you, too. So Achilles goes to the sea, and I'm open there on page 11 of the Iliad. It's uh, perhaps the most famous passage in the Iliad. And it can't be famous because it's dramatic, because there's really nothing to it, except that it speaks to something profoundly deep in all of us. But when you are angry, you have to go away for a while and nurture the anger. And that's, maybe Jack will tell us that's part of the process of healing, I don't know. We'll see. We're going to have Jack speak for a few moments on anger management. So I'm on page 11, uh, line 360. The Achilles is in, they've had an argument about who's going to, uh, who's going to be the captain of the team, and Agamemnon says, Achilles, uh, you're not going to be the captain. And Achilles says, okay, give me the, give me the uh, football. I'm going home. Withdrawal is a standard technique that we all use when we get angry. Okay, I won't say good morning to you for the rest of my life. <laughs> if you think I'm going to say good morning to you, dear, and we wake up tomorrow morning, you're crazy. <laughs> I'm going to sulk. <laughs> in the dining room for nine hours until you recognize how justified my anger is in serving the children before you served me last night. <laughs> I've never experienced that, but Paul has told me about that. <laughs> 360. Then Achilles, in tears, withdrew from his friends and sat down far away on the foaming white seashore staring out at the endless sea and stretching out his hands he prayed over and over to his beloved mother his mother's name is Thetis she's a goddess of the sea mother since you bore me for a short life only Olympian Zeus was supposed to grant me honor well, he hasn't given me any honor at all. Agamemnon has taken away my prize and dishonored me. And his voice, choked with tears, was heard by his mother as she sat in the sea depths beside her old father. And she rose up from the white-capped sea like a mist, and settling herself beside her weeping child, she stroked him with her hand and talked to him. Why are you crying, son? What's wrong? Don't keep it inside. Tell me so we'll both know. And the simplest way of looking at that is just to say that nature heals. I don't know if one goes out into the woods behind his own house. <laughs> One is upset, but all of us do that. As a matter of fact, a good mother or a good father says, go out and take a walk and get it. <laughs> when the four-year-old goes into a tantrum. Get away from the profile. And as a matter of fact, that's part of the whole process here in this mythological 
statement of how one deals with anger by withdrawal. It's not a good way if the withdrawal is going to be permanent. Toynbee, who is the greatest historian of civilization that we have, says that there are, there are a number of elemental rules that are present in any great civilization. One of them is the greater the challenge, the greater the response. You can't make a great civilization unless there's a big problem facing you. That's number one. Number two is withdrawal and return. If you do get upset and walk away, be sure it's so that you can heal and come back stronger, not so you can stay away. And all of us do that. All of us do that. At least I do that a lot. Somebody hurts me and don't doesn't know that they hurt me, you're not going to see me for three or four weeks. And Achilles does that, and the, the, the image here in the Iliad of Achilles being comforted by his mother at the seashore is meant by Homer to ask us to examine the ways in which we have withdrawn when we have been hurt, and what solace we have found in the withdrawal, and third, whether or not we have returned from that stronger or stayed away like Achilles until everything around him collapsed. Everything around him. I have a very good friend whose son became angry with him 25 years ago, never seen the sun at the age of 18. <coughs> Not seen the sun since. I have another friend whose daughter did the same thing. Over probably some inconsequential thing. And eventually there will be some kind of catastrophe <coughs> there. It'll bring down more than those people involved. Okay, now let's go to the Odyssey. The Odyssey, the Iliad begins at book one. The Odyssey doesn't begin at book one, it begins at book five. Books one through four of the Odyssey are strangely called the Telemachy, which is the story of Telemachus. So the Odyssey opens with four chapters about Odysseus's child. And Homer asks us to understand that whoever Odysseus is, the best way to understand him is to look at his children. So that when I bring my own children here on campus, I kind of risk that you might know me better through watching them than you would by looking at me. And, and we all know that. You spot a child, you say, oh, oh something's not going right in that house. <laughs> and that's what Homer does in the Odyssey. The first four books are all about Telemachus, who's growing up, and he says, okay, now that you've seen the way he operates, imagine what his father is like. Imagine what his father is like. But in book five, Odysseus comes on the scene. And watch, in terms of that film I just showed you, how you see him for the first time. I'm in the Odyssey now. Go to page 72. Uh, line 84. Odysseus was sitting on the shore as ever in those days, holding his heart's sorrow, staring out to sea with hollow, salt-rimmed eyes. It's a little bit more desolate than Achilles. Achilles at least has a goddess answering him, and there's something in the sea that's comforting. But not here. This is another character type who faces the sea, and whose face shows that there is pain that's not going to be resolved. But look at the description there, staring out to sea with hollow, salt-rimmed eyes. Hold just a minute. go 
to page 74. Calypso is a goddess. Calypso is a goddess. We, we asked yesterday about uh, whether the eternal is the god of the now or the god of the hereafter. It's a really interesting question. How do you encounter God in paradise after your uh, earthly sojourn is over or now? And the answer is that it's both. In both. In the Odyssey, Homer rejects immortality in favor of the joys of home. The Greek sense of uh, immortality was so impoverished that Homer, that uh, Odysseus says, I, he's offered immortality by Calypso in the same way that the poor Muslim terrorists thought they were going to have a paradise with 20 virgins for each one. That's their sense of heaven. They disturbed people. That's not Islam. They disturbed people. Well, the, the Greeks had that something of that same kind of sense of things. That immortality would be being with a beautiful woman for a long time and never growing old. It's not far from what Hollywood thinks is the answer. It's not, we haven't left that behind. You see these people on television now who are your age and my age and they've had more skin pinups on their face. <laughs> and, they, and there's a wonderful, wonderful movie about them. It's at Sunset Strip with William Holden and uh, Gloria Swanson. The, the, the woman who thinks that uh, the only meaning in life is to stay forever and be immortally beautiful. Uh, the beauty that we construct with our lives is not physical beauty. What is essential is invisible to the eye. We are meant to be weavers of beauty. We are meant to do that, to do what Penelope does. She weaves moments of beauty into a great fabric. And we're meant to do that. We're to do it through those that we know and love and serve. Greek insight is a little bit off kilter. We always read things too literally. We say beauty and we think physical beauty and uh, that won't work. Beauty has to be more than skin deep to be beautiful. Okay, so we're on the page 74 and uh, line 148. Calypso composed herself and went to Odysseus she had a message from Zeus still ringing in her ears, which is, let that guy go. And she found him sitting where the breakers rolled in. And his eyes were perpetually wet with tears now, his life draining away in home sickness. And the nymph had long since sense to please. That's Calypso. She's the nymph. She's offered him immortality and paradise, just being with her and never getting old. And this is, he has this insight. That won't work. He has the insight that Hollywood doesn't have. That's not going to work. You know that wonderful poem, How Do Van Adam Grow Old With Me? The Best Is Yet To Be? It's true. It's truer than Hollywood. Although all of us would like to go the other way. I don't know if I ought to get the skin tucked my wife wants me to get or not. <laughs> she wants it around my middle. <laughs> I just tell me that's my homage to her good cooking. His eyes were perpetually wet with tears now. His life draining away in homesickness. Calypso had long since ceased to please. He still slept with her at night in the cavern, an unwilling lover mated to her eager embrace. In days he spent sitting on the rocks by the breakers, staring out to sea with hollow, salt-rimmed eyes. So both the Odyssey and the Iliad begin with individuals staring out to sea. Because Homer wants us to know, and Ralph Waldo Emerson wants us to know, we all do that in some way. How we do that, it's uh, for each of us individually to say. And maybe you can talk about um, that. I took a group of students here to Ireland. And there were uh, several students who spent all their time sitting on rocks down by the sea. That's all they wanted out of the experience. They 
didn't want castles, they didn't want pubs. All they wanted was the sound of that movement of the surf that you saw in Genova. That was enough. And I sometimes think that would be enough for me. I grew up by the sea. My dad was with the U.S. Uh, Maritime Service. And uh, my early life in New York City were right by the sea. Our house was right on the sea. Reagan is uh, to be buried in a library that looks out over the sea. And that helps us to understand something in the Odyssey. And let's go now, I think, to um, book 24 of the Odyssey. Mysterious passage in the Odyssey. No critic has yet uh, understood it fully enough to convince uh, all other critics uh, what it's about. Uh, but it's very clear that the whole message of the Iliad and the Odyssey is contained in this passage. I'm on page 361. Page 361. And I'm going down to line 273. Odysseus has uh, encountered his wife Penelope, we're at the end of the Odyssey now, it's alright to give away the ending. Uh